Well, to start with, um, uh, I, I feel very much encouraged by what I have listened to so far, both in private conversations and in the various panels. Um, a, a good mixture of optimism Are and realism. Are you saying realism. this because you used to be a diplomat? No, yeah. not at all. Okay. Not at all. No, I, this is my true thought. Thank you. Um, optimism and realism at the same time. Um, it, is, it is, of course, tempting um, to be very optimistic in the sense that suddenly uh, a country of 80 million people who have been sort of cut out of the of the international system suddenly are welcomed back into the, into the warmth of the international community and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of people see enorm enormous pot uh, possibilities and potential. That's of course correct. But I think you have to be very realistic. And it has nothing to do with Iran as such. I think when you see these sort of very dramatic changes that we have experienced, uh, it takes a long time before people adapt to the new reality, and you have to be realistic. You have to be optimistic and realistic. Uh, what does being realistic mean? Does it mean you've got to be very patient? You have to be patient. Uh, let, me, let me start with one example uh, of a policy change that I understand is gradually coming to Iran and that is the potential, the possibility of Iran joining the WTO. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the WTO is a set of rules, regulations, uh, uh, decision-making processes that, is, that has a long culture behind it. So even if Iran would decide now, negotiate and maybe enter the WTO in, let's say, three years' time, uh, this is a cultural change that requires a number of changes inside the country and in the mentality of people who are taking decisions, both in the public and in the private sector. This takes time. How long, did it, take, how long did it take China? China is not there yet. Not there yet? No. Exactly. <laughs> uh, sorry. No, so, so I, th that's why you have to be patient. You have to be realistic in your expectations. Yeah. Joachim. So the question is, um, how do you make Iranian economy competitive? Let me explain why, uh, why I'm here, besides the presence of uh, uh, your company. Angta, uh, that the organization I represent, which is <coughs> basically UN Trade and Development, has been requested by the Iranian government to help them with their reform plans, including for WTO accession. Our assessment of Iran is as follows. It's punches below, far below its weight. Um, just to give you a hard fact, its best FDI inflow year is still half of the Peruvian worst year. Wow. And so clearly from the point of view of the potential, it's enormous potential, but it's largely untapped, number one. Number two, what we've been asked is to think about and advise them on the economic reforms necessary to put them on a track of integrating the global economy in a competitive way. And from our point of view, uh, judging on the economic policy issues that we look at, first, we need to reboot the entrepreneurial system. Second, we need to have a system of trade openness that spur continuous productivity growth. Third, we need to improve technological uptake and innovation system based on also fully utilizing FDI openness. And finally, we need a much more diversified export, pro uh, export portfolio, the reliance on one commodity for the exports is, is stifling. And to be honest, that's a very, very tall order. And that goes to the same part, point that Eric was making in terms of time as well as mindset. Um, we were invited mainly because of the forthcoming, hopefully forthcoming WTO accession. But that provides the hook to actually tackle these reforms, provided the mindset is 100% on using the WTO accession for domestic betterment. It is not a game whereby you wish something from the rest of the world. You need to wish it for yourself. And I think that's where we come in and, and give advice on what are the options uh, and how a country can best use WTO accession to basically reform itself and put in place proper economic rule of law. I mean, is it, forgive my naivety or ignorance, but I mean, is it um, 
possible, is it reasonable to suppose that while primary U.S. sanctions remain, you could have Iran joining the WTO? Uh, no. Uh, basically, w the situation we're in right now is that uh, Iran is not allowed to get its chairman of the working party in WTO uh, selected. Now, that does not prevent in any shape or form, because the process actually has already started for Iran, it's just that we can't move to the negotiating yeah. phase. But the basic accession is two parts. One is legislative reforms in the country in question, which is you actually can run without a chairman. Yeah. The second one is bilateral market access negotiations, by which you actually de determine which sectors you open up and how much. For that, you need to have a counterpart. And as long as Iran is preventing from having, having a chairman, it doesn't have a pr counterpart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there are very intensive discussions in WTO on trying to solve this during the course of this year. Whether people succeed, that's a good separate question. But that's very intensive discussions going on. Yes, well, um, talking about the uh, global competitiveness of the Iranian economy, uh, this may sound odd after all these discussions for the two days, is that uh, at the sh in the short term, or even towards the midterm, I believe that the energy sector still plays a critical role for Iran, domestically and also for its uh, international um, status. So uh, with all the geostrategical advantages and uh, merits it uh, has, it still needs to concentrate on how to balance its energy portfolio. Uh, by uh, this has already been um, touched upon, but uh, it has to do with the supply side and also the demand side uh, within the country. Now, for the uh, supply side, uh, the country has been running after the nuclear uh, facilities. Uh, I mean, they have their own right to go for that. But uh, if we look at the time that is consumed to uh, actually build one and to get it uh, get one operating on its grid. And now it's going to take another decade or so to have, for them to have their second reactor in operation. And God knows how long it's going to take until they have their 20th reactor on grid. So uh, at the meantime, I believe that they have to uh, deal with this issue by bringing in possibly the renewables, as people have already mentioned before. Uh, solar, wind, I believe there is a, a huge potential for that. But at the same time, if we had, they have to look into the demand side, which is the how to uh, control the emergence or how to control the uh, sur uh, surge in the uh, transportation uh, sector, uh, especially the fuel, gasoline, gas oil. Yeah. Uh, for them, uh, they need to have some sort of a way to improve their efficiency in uh, consumption of uh, fuel oil. And that hasn't been ta really uh, been taken care of. And without ha that happening, now with the JCPO and its uh, procedures and that it's going to bring in more cash possibly, hopefully, and uh, investment uh, into Iran, then you have the industry running even uh, further, uh, be, uh, further, uh, further beyond uh, upon its level of uh, today's capacity. So it would mean that they would have to deal with the issue uh, quite soon, uh, uh, sooner or later, uh, without that happening, they are going to, uh, I mean, a, in a very bad shape with their economy eventually. I mean, one thing that came up in the previous session, if you talk about the demand side of energy, was to cut subsidies. Right. Is that feasible? I mean, it is if feasible, were, technically If you were feasible. President Rouhani's advisor right. now, <laughs> hoping to be that he's re-elected, et cetera, Yes, well, this has been the discussion since the early 1990s with, uh, when uh, Hashemi Rafsanjani was the president. Yeah. And ever since then, uh, the successive uh, presidents were trying to deal with that. Ahmadinejad, President Ahmadinejad, actually did something about it. But of course, it was not in the right moment, possibly, to do that. But uh, well, not only that, I mean, I believe that uh, there needs to be some way to reduce the uh, consumption itself, not only by the price mechanism, but also through the uh, innovation of yeah. technology and introducing more efficient cars, vehicles, and other m ways to, um, uh, to generate uh, power and so on and so forth. Now, uh, Iran, along with Saudi Arabia, unfortunately here, is known to be uh, one of the highest consumers of energy per capita in the world. Yeah. And yeah. that has to be changed. I and mean, without that happening, 
I believe that uh, Iran is going to have a, even more difficult times in the years ahead. Eric, you wanted. I, I just want a, 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 sort of a technical, political addition to this. Um, uh, all politicians are afraid of cutting subsidies or increasing yeah. prices when they can do so. I think one of the mistakes psychologically they're doing is that they think that it's a one-time shot. Uh, it hurts at the moment and then it goes over. I have a totally contrarian view. I think one should increase prices gradually and make it clear to everybody that over the next two, three, four years, we will increase by so and so much on that date and that date and that date. Uh, like a little bit like the central banks are trying to teach the market <laughs> what the interest rate is going to be forward, going yeah. forward. And they yeah. have a line going two years forward almost. Uh, and you can do exactly the same thing with energy prices. And that's what I think you should do. Okay, fair enough. I think, um, what's that managed expectation? There's a, there's a word for, that the central bankers use, a phrase for trying to sort of forward, um, I can't remember the phrase for it, but it's, I take your point. Uh, any questions, please, for this distinguished <coughs> panel? Yes. Uh, there's a microphone coming now. Hello. I think the ultimate aim of uh, joining WTO, FDI, produ productivity is for the country to prosper. Now, how do you see the Iranian economy, uh, the absorptive capacity of the Iranian economy to use the process of FDI or joining the WTO to use that to prosper and to use that in the economy? I think, uh, yes. Um, okay. Well, I, I recently was chairing a meeting with um, the 70, 80 uh, ministers from commodity-dependent countries, and my core message was never miss the opportunity of a good crisis. Yes. Um, to some extent, you, uh, in my view, um, Iran does not really have a choice. Um, now, what will be critical is that it has a proper understanding of how to... Um, utilize his strengths. Um, I'll be honest with you, I had lengthy discussions with Iranian officials. I was quite worried when they started comparing with the Chinese industrialization model or the Korean or the Taiwanese or the Brazilian. How anyone could compare with Brazil right now, I don't know. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, one of the questions I asked, well, you have a huge advantage in, you have, you have a de demographic de uh, dividend, but on top of it, you have a pretty high educated population. Yeah. That allows you s it's some drawbacks because you can't throw labor into assembly lines, which is the usual way that you tap into globalization by basically, the, I mean, there's a Chinese Taiwanese model. On the other hand, that means you're going to have to go for higher value added. But that's the main challenge of many countries as they join global trade is to figure out actually how they climb the value added. And Iran will have the advantage of entering into the global division of labor at a higher level. Now, the basic challenge, as far as I can see, and the reason why I say there is no choice, the current circumstances, in my view, has led to completely perverted price structure, where, of course, the premium on having capital in a closed economy is enormous, as opposed to being labor. So, as a means of actually employing and trying to provide a future for the 25% or more unemployed below 35 or 30, you're going to have to have a solution pretty quickly. And for that, you have to ignite the engines of economic growth. And un unfortunately, there is no other way to do that than to be open in today's world. So it's, it's pr pretty much as basic as that. Now, there will be repercussions. My personal assessment, and we're going to have to dig deeper into that, my personal, uh, you know, there's di redistributional effects of openness, basically. And, but my assessment in the case of Iran, preliminarily, is that the main losers will be state-owned enterprise, state-supported uh, cartels, monopolies, and the like which in any case will have to reform as part of a WTO accession because there's simply no way that WTO members will accept that these companies still de facto control our access to the market and profitability of foreign companies. So you might as well face, you know, face the reality, and I think that's why I'm saying there is a large possibility untapped. It will be more, more difficult journey than if, you had, if you're entering at the lower stages. On the other hand, the potential returns from entering global markets is higher with a more educated population because you can accrue more value out of the total division of labor in terms of, say, global value chains, what uh, you're producing. But then you have to accept, to give you a current example, and Eric, I discussed that before we got in here. 
Um, one of the things that is very difficult for countries to accept is that you cannot export unless you import. Mm. And but it's not, for example, the FDI in, in natural resources, that's not the driver for growth. It's actually the FDI into the services economy and the way you liberalize the service economy as a lubricant for growth as a whole. It is unleashing the private sector development for which FDI is a crucial part, but that's other sectors than the usual crown jewels if you're natural resource rich. Now, I absolutely accept your economic uh, analysis, but isn't there a contradiction in terms? As long as you have sanctions, you can't really have an open economy. It's just not going to happen. And, yeah. uh, and I don't, uh, I don't really accept that. <laughs> Go for it. I don't, see the, I don't see the contradiction. Yes, there are sanctions in the sense that the United States still has some sanctions in, in place. And of course, but significant. But you've heard how all these European banks are scared stiff yeah, yeah. of the risk in the US, yes. a risk which the State Department would say is not there. Yes, but there but are, while you have that, you're not going to get the trade there interest. Are, there are a number of non-European banks and non-American banks, I would argue. Uh, but but I tier would one like banks to, or uh, not? Well, there are lots of banks in India, in Malaysia. But they're not in tier China. one necessarily. I mean, you know, it well, comes. Well, for, I mean, Hinduja for our, correspondent for our bank. purposes, no. you don't have to be tier one bank. Okay. Hmm? Well, others yeah. thought you did. No, I um, don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. No. But, but it's not only. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's not only a question of the banking uh, system. Yeah. I mean, take for example the issue of the full application of competition rules, mm -hmm. uh, addressing cartelization, addressing de facto state propped up monopolies. I mean, that's not relying on the access of banking from foreign countries. That's True. purely domestic homework. Yeah. And that in itself would create much more opportunity for Indian youth to actually create their own companies and grow. Yeah. Let me just give sure. you one yeah. example of a service industry that generates enormous amount of jobs, doesn't require much capital, and is, is a fairly well, globally, a fairly well-functioning Tour industry. Tourism. Yeah. Exactly. Tourism. Exactly. Yeah. Tourism. And tourism has some positive by-effects yeah. in the sense that more people get to know each other, uh, you change your image, uh, you, you can improve your image globally. Uh, I've seen so many examples of that. Um, uh, one, the best one, I think, is when Spain decided that it would suddenly open up its economy, join the European Union. At the same time, the government decided that they would boost the uh, tourism sector. And it worked miracles. Yeah. Miracles. No, I'm absolutely with you. It's the world's greatest generator of, of jobs, actually. Yeah. Uh, another question, please. There is, you counted to silence, my goodness. Tanaka san, it's up to you to save the day. What do you think? Well, I was just about to raise my hand. Um, uh, what I was trying to say is that, yes, uh, Iran could do or proceed to do uh, um, undergo changes that is required in the current world. Um, they, they can do voluntarily, but pro for the problem, uh, I mean, it's, it's here it's quite similar with other governments, especially my government, is that uh, even though we know what is supposed to be done, uh, eventually it won't be tapped until there is sort of an external pressure yeah. exerted. Of course, uh, external pressure just generates further frustration within, so it could be more difficult for the government to proceed with that uh, method. But anyway, external pressure uh, would be the trigger for the government or certain governments to move forward. So here, Iran may know, and I believe that they know quite well, that what is supposed to be done to adapt themselves to the modern world, and especially during the past 10 years or so, this us extreme sanctions that they've been quite left uh, behind from the uh, developments. Now, uh, the problem here is now are they willing to do that by themselves without a actually being told to do so or actually persuaded to do so? So uh, I believe here uh, Europeans, our government, uh, I, I, I believe also the United Nations as an international body also share the same, uh, say, um, uh, obligation to uh, persuade the Iranians, our friends in Tehran, to proceed in a certain manner that they have to adjust themselves so that they could be, uh, say, fully engaged once all the barriers, in one way or the other, are removed. Yeah, okay, well, when you are talking with uh, Iranian officials and politicians, 
I mean, do they hear what you're saying? Yeah, um, yeah, I think. Um, or do they <laughs> sort of uh, say yes, yes, yes? No, cup of coffee to you. No, no. I actually think we, no. My view is that we they turn to us. Yeah. And they know what what we're putting on offer. I mean, we basically come in and we rewrite laws, leg regulations, policies. We go through, we audit <laughs> legislative frameworks, policies in investment trade, ICT policies, science and technology innovation policies, entrepreneurship policies. So people know what they're asking for. Yeah. And the Iranian government is incredibly, uh, uh, um, in my view, well-informed and skillful in trying to make use of the friends that are out there that can give them a positive contribution for the direction that we want to go. But I'll be honest with you, I mean, like every government, they're struggling with uh, very strong forces internally, especially when you're dealing with reforms. Um, I mean, then, uh, that's, that's, that's the first challenge. The second challenge is the size of the leap. Yes. My sense is that there is not a full recognition yet in all quarters, uh, including by the reformist, on the, si the, the magnitude of the leap involved. Uh. So, I'll give you a concrete example. I mean, Iran will not get away with high car tariffs as part of the WTO accession. Yeah. And this is many times, even if you talk with the most reform oriented, they presume that the cars is a strategic sector that they because can protect. Because they had the old um, yeah, but the automobile there, industry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But Europe and the United yeah. States has never conceded yeah. to keep tariffs on cars unbound or at high level. Yeah. So that's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a matter of just making a realistic assessment of your counterpart and the demand of your counterpart. Similarly, the manner in which you operate tariffs, which is a huge barrier on trade, irrespective of the yeah. sanctions, the fact that they're operated almost like an ad hoc basis by a council that suddenly decides that you have a little bit of quota there and not on there, and then the next month you have another quota there. I mean, all of this has to go. Yeah. It, not, there can't be a single part of it left once it has joined WTO. You're going to have to have a clear-cut, established, full predictable and full transparent, locked-in tariff levels which basically means there's no discretion, it's gone. And the full understanding that economic rule of law means getting rid of discretion is very difficult for all governments as they do the journey of WTO accession. Now, you're talking about a big leap, and Eric was talking about gradualism, little, little steps. Uh, <laughs> where do you two agree, then? Your case is absolutely right, of course. I mean, all these things have to, to go uh, through a WTO accession or voluntarily. There's no, no discussion about that. But at the same time, I, I, I must recognize the psychological difficulties of taking big steps, and we have to be, to be realistic. Uh, if I take only my own country, uh, Sweden, uh, who, who has been now, I think, over the years, able to defend its, uh, its economic record quite well, uh, the journey started in 1860, when we started liberalizing international trade. And we have now come to a point where a minister publicly is able to say that import is as important as export. Yeah. Well, that's public policy. Yeah. Well, we have to import. That's good for the economy. We have to import. Yeah. Uh, it will take time. You mean people are sort of wedded to mercantilism? They absolutely, think, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you see it not only in Iran, you see it in many other countries. Uh, the second thing, which I think is also a very important lesson that we've learned in our country, and that is that politicians should not get involved in trying to micromanage the economy. Politicians should see to it that we have a rule of law, that we have uh, courts that operate, Etc. Cetera, et cetera. So decisions are taken, but you cannot pick one industry or that industry and say this is the future for us. We had a very bitter experience in in Sweden in the 70s when we were the leading nation besides Japan in building ships, and then came the crisis, and the government said, "Oh, we have to continue to build ships, and we have to do this and that." Nothing helped, and today we have almost no shipping industry left, and we are very happy about that. Yeah. We are very happy about that. Well, and, and, but of course, it takes time to recognize these things and, and assimilate them. 
As you know, the UK has had um, similar experiences. I mean, the car industry, etc. But in fact, by selling the car industry to the Japanese, etc., it's worked very well. We produce an enormous number of cars now. But on your incrementalism, I mean, you can have big bangs. We had a big bang in the financial sector in Britain. Malta had a big bang for its banks. I mean, it surely it can happen. You don't. The risk of incrementalism is that the increments can go the wrong way. If, uh, if there's a change of government. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a final question? Yes, just here. And it has to be the last one because then we'll be out of time. Uh, my question is about the uh, economy of resistance meta policy that uh, has been uh, actively pursued in, in Iran. And I, I just want to understand panelists' views as to how you perceive that. Mm, good question. Yeah, okay. You okay? <laughs> no, no one else wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> the UN is neutral, you see. You can, you can. What specific aspects do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, nah, I'm a little bit uncomfortable about this. I mean, one, one of the things that we uh, had very open and frank discussions, and I, I'm consciously now to, trying to reinterpret your question just to be aware of what I'm doing. Um, we had basically uh, the mentality, to be honest, and it was in a very heated discussion um, that we had with a number of advisors to the government. In the end, someone sort of out of frustration, exclaimed, ex made an exclamation of saying, well, you know, you have to understand our Cold War ended on 16th of January. I think that was a wake-up call for my team in the sense that, you know, we, to be honest, on the issue of gradualism, we don't have a problem. Yeah. The key thing for us is that you know what the target is and that you're persistently pursuing it. I'll give you a concrete example of this is Vietnam, who actually has established since many years back that he wanted to dismantle the heavy involvement of the state in the economy. 39% of the economy is state-owned. State interference is 70% of the economy, right? So what has it done? WTO accession started it, TPP. I mean, it's not a small thing for Vietnam to join TPP. So it actually has had an objective, and then it's using the various tools to get there. I think Iran is yet to get out of that. It's still Frankly, when we have a discussion, it's still a big journey for the way that it has tried to construct its economy to have the resilience by not basically being honestly cannot trust neither its neighborhood nor many of its uh, traditional trading partners. I think that's a, you know, that's a fair assessment of where they've been. I think that is a recipe for sliding down in the global po um, prosperity index. So at the extreme, it's uh, Juche in North Korea. The no, I, I, but basically we're living in a world where constantly every government on earth is trying to increase their competitiveness. Yeah. The doing business index of the World Bank, I mean, you won't come across a single country that is not trying to climb that index, which basically means, and people are getting better and better at it, which means if you're joining the race now, you're going to have to be even better than them. And they have done this for 5, 10, 15 years. So that's why, in our sense, we understand and we're trying to adjust actually along the lines of gradualism, as long as we're not tampering what's the objective. Because ultimately the objective is not about, um, at least from UNCTAD's point of view, it's not so much about Iran's position, share of global world trade. It's about the jobs for the young in Iran. It's about whether private entrepreneurs can stay in Iran and get a good li livelihood. That's the type of questions we're asking. Then you have to fix your trade policies so as to achieve that. Because the power of trade is not by capturing large market shares globally, it is by way you actually enrich your population. As we say in Swedish, tak. That's good. Uh, <laughs> I think, sadly, we've come to the end. And thank you very much. Brilliant panel. Uh, thank you very much to the audience.